Good afternoon. Um, I assume that everyone can hear me. Um, and Tom, is this all ready to go? Um, perfect, we are live. Okay, um, so thank you, Tom and Ian, for organizing this. Um, having attended a lot of the webinars, it's been very, very useful from uh, our end, and um, a huge wealth of knowledge has been shared, which I hope uh, I can add to now. Um, so I'm going to be talking for the next 20 or so minutes about uh, security and protection using RFID technology in the, uh, in the museum sector. Um, I'm going to take us through this slideshow focusing on two key elements. What is an RFID solution, a radio frequency identification solution, and how is it applicable to the cultural sector, specifically one that's exiting the effects of COVID-19? And how does a typical RFID system work? And what are its various possible applications? And then we'll look at a couple of case studies um, of two museums using uh, radio frequency as its primary security solution, and then take some questions at the end if, if there are any. So what is an RFID solution? Um, RFID, the radio frequency identification used in a plethora of different industries and environments from military to the arts. Um, it's simply a burst of binary messages sent through the air from a wireless or wired device, depending on the type of solution, uh, into a network of readers that will be sitting within about 150 to 200 meters in open space and down to about 25 to 50 meters within the confines of a building. Um, so taking that broad brushstroke, how does that apply to a museum? Well, in essence, one can simply use those chipsets, those radio frequency chipsets, put them into credit card size shaped tags, adhere them to the back of artworks, and suddenly you've given the artwork itself its ability to control uh, an anti-theft measure, um, to control the environment within, within which it sits from temperature, humidity, and lux, and notify the key holders um, through software as to any changes in those and to uh, any movement that it may suffer or vibration if it comes under attack. So that's basically what radio frequency does. It, it, it removes the um, need for human control over artworks at all times and gives the artworks the ability to send in messages back to a centralized software solution at the front end and the ability for the museum then to monitor every artwork and, and asset or every display case within its, uh, within its collection from one uh, server and one screen. So not having to have you know, hundreds of people going around the museums at all times, checking off artworks, making sure they should be where they are. So the next few slides will show sort of in more detail how that actually works um, and how it can be expanded from simply looking after pictures to uh, being effective in all aspects of museum security and protection. So an RFID solution is first and foremost 24-7, so it will be operating during both open and closed hours. Um, it will be running in the background, uh, either behind its intruder alarm, a museum's intruder alarm, or with integrated with into a building management system, a security management system, uh, or running autonomously in the uh, security room. And it's going to be monitoring for about eight things. Motion, so the movement of a picture or a sculpture. Proximity, through integration to third-party hardware, into lasers and other third-party hardware, one can send um, laser fields down the walls and that can then be registered as alarm in the software in the same way that the movement of a picture can. Vibration, so simply vibration chipsets. That is to say that if there are specific sculptures in the museum that a curator is nervous about, then having um, a vibration tag on it can monitor for the amount of vibration that simple things like constant footfall might uh, create within the display case, possibly damaging it ever so slightly, and then denoting that the work needs to be moved. 
uh, location within the museum. Uh, each radio frequency tag will be registered to a specific artwork in a specific area and will be sending signals back to a reader, the reader closest to it, both showing where it should be, where it's designed to be through uh, human um, uh, accordance with sort of the museum's uh, uh, specifications and also showing if it's moving at all by showing which reader it might be picked up. So if it is being moved, you'll be able to follow it without around the museum, not to a um, GPS level of tracking, but to wherever the nearest reader is and seeing the signal strength from that reader. Uh, so allowing you to track artworks. Tamper, if someone tries to remove the tag, um, it will be creating a tamper alarm, which will be due to do with a rare earth magnet within the poly wallet, which it is sitting within at the back of the painting or artwork. Um, and then we come to pressure, which is another piece of hardware altogether, integrated with a RFID tag, which uh, will detect any addition or removal of pressure on a plinth, obviously designed for sculptures. And then the three at the bottom there are temperature, relative humidity, and lux, the environmental chipsets. That is to say that each one of our tags, each one of an RFID tag, so I can be fitted with um, temperature, relative humidity, and lux chipsets, which will give the artwork the ability to report into the software exactly what those three, uh, what the status of those three uh, specific environmental conditions are, and allow for um, to be integrated into a building management system and control the actual environment around it as long as such a system is in place. So this slide gives a, a system overview. Here you can see um, readers at the top there um, and on the right we have the front end which is the software and then three of our three of the most basic tags. Uh, the one at the center is a flat art tag so that would be adhered to the back of this uh, beautiful Kandinsky and be sitting there monitoring for any acceleration and any changes in the temperature and humidity um, and possibly vibration as well if um, you're concerned about the picture being vibrated due to footfall or, or banging doors or whatever it might be. The guard here also has a tag. Um, that tag has a push button in it and it allows for the guard to alert the security hub to any um, possible threats that might be coming into the room. This was developed uh, as a radio frequency model due to the attack in the Munch Museum when one of the screen versions of the screen was stolen in 2006 um, by armed burglars and the security guards had no way to communicate with the hub room without um, using their radios, quite obviously, to the armed intruders. And so before the people in the security hub were, had their attention drawn to it through CCTV, the, um, the burglars had already left the building. So we have given the ability for um, security guards to also uh, alert the hub to uh, any threats that may come into that room. And then to the left, we have a cuboid tag here, which can be used uh, in display cases to detect for open and close using a magnet if something's left, been left open uh, for vibration again, which is a tag, and for um, all the environmental conditions. So to uh, install something like this within the museum, it's relatively low touch. It's been designed that way specifically because um, RFID is, is a fairly modern uh, solution and it's obviously being installed in the cultural sector into uh, an incredibly old and listed buildings for the most part and occasionally um, into the new, uh, new museums being built across the world, which, which we'll get to later. But it, the readers are using power over Ethernet, so they only require standard Cat5 or 6 network cable to be pulled to the relevant spaces. And they will be um, installed out of sight. So that is um, behind ceilings, within risers, beneath floorboards, um, either occasionally mounted on the wall, which some, uh, some museums do because they like to show that it's there as a deterrent. Um, but for the most part, they are they are hidden and out of sight. Um, they can be out of sight because the radio frequency wave is an incredibly flat one. It's not like Wi-Fi, which will be blocked by things like uh, thick brick walls or timber. Radio frequency will penetrate all of that. The only um, two materials that attenuate radio frequency are water and sheet metal. So 
those are the only two sort of prohibitive uh, materials to installing things, uh, readers like this. But the installation of readers, you can always account for sheet metal and just move them ever so slightly or indeed drop uh, the antennas through the metal sheeting if there's no other way around it. So very low touch point in terms of the installation. And then obviously at tag level, I'm sorry, here we are. I have another slide on the reader installation just showing how radio frequency works. So it's actually the readers that will be scanning the air for tag messages. And with any installation using radio frequency, you're going to have at least double coverage from one reader. So here you'll see that there is four readers in the room and they're all overlapping, creating this Venn diagram where the center has two or three bits of coverage, but every single part has at least two readers covering it. And that's just a fail safe to allow for the fact that one reader might go offline for whatever reason, you've still got coverage for another one. And these readers scan the airwaves uh, about 400 times a second, looking for binary burst radio frequency messages being sent to them by tags. And they can be located, as I said, within uh, the confines of the museum, about 25 to 50 meters away from the tag itself. So the amount of readers needed uh, tends to be much smaller than initially anticipated um, because of their ability to penetrate so many materials at such great extent. At artwork level, it's entirely wireless. Um, again, it's been designed this way for the cultural sector, specifically because of the nature of temporary exhibition spaces, uh, the changing nature of art galleries, and the um, want and ability for curators to be able to move paintings around without having to contact various contractors and start adding more expense to what should be a fairly straightforward system. And so here we can see there are three different types of tag here, the cuboid tag on the upper left, the panic alarm on the upper right, and the standard picture tag at the angle there. Um, the tags can last anywhere between seven to about 15 years, depending on the heartbeat message. They are all designed initially to have a 30 second heartbeat radio frequency message which means that every 30 seconds, you're having a complete audit of the entire collection of the museum. Each tag will send just a binary burst of messages back to the readers saying, I'm still here. The temperature, humidity, lux are within the confines that have been set by the curatorial department in uh, software. Uh, no one's moved me and I haven't vibrated. Um, should they then go into alarm, it's not a case of waiting 29 or whatever seconds it might be for that to register. They go into alarm in real time, sending, sending four binary messages um, every second. Um, if you extend that 30 second heartbeat message to anywhere from two to four minutes, then you can be looking at battery lives on these tags of up to 15 years, which is the longest we've ever had um, from our first client, uh, which we'll get onto a bit later. Um, so they're low energy con consumption. They are also um, RFID tags tend to be ultrasonically sealed. Um, obviously, when it comes to batteries, everyone knows that um, standard lithium batteries uh, have in the past combusted. Um, so ultrasonically sealing tags and using a manganese wafer ASIC battery um, removes the possibility for um, for sorry, that's my dog. Uh, for there to be any combustions um, within the tags themselves, and that ultrasonic seal prevents any leakage and off gases as well. Um, and it's all been oddly tested by um, by the Wallace Collection and others of our clients. So radio frequency doesn't just mean uh, tags; it can mean it can mean much, much more. Um, it can be integrated into uh, any number of, of different hardwares that are used in the cultural sector. Uh, on this slide, we can see uh, a Giacometti exhibition. Um, and what look to be normal plinths are actually uh, fitted with um, piezo crystal pressure feet. That is to say that any uh, change in the temperature, oh, sorry, in the temperature, in the uh, pressure on those plinths, so that is removing of the sculpture or something being placed on it, or someone just simply leaning on it, will raise an alarm in software. Um, so how has that been achieved? It's seemingly two disparate technologies, but actually all it takes is to add a radio frequency IO input output tag 
into um, the alarm box of the piezo crystal uh, pressure plinth, and then you've got something that's going to wirelessly send its messages back into the same network of receivers as uh, a picture or display case might. Um, it essentially allows for the security teams to combine various different technologies under one suite of software. Um, moving on, you'll see that this also applies to things like volumetric object surveillance units used at uh, museums like um, the Royal Academy. And this is uh, on the left here, we have the um, Pompidou in, in Paris. Um, and they, again, are using infrared reflectivity to essentially create 3D cones around sculptures to um, prevent anyone from getting too close. Uh, invisible, so not disturbing the aesthetics of the uh, of the museum in question, uh, but incredibly effective. Um, and any refracted light that is then sent back into the VOS there will send an alarm into the, uh, the RFID enterprise software, again, allowing for the security team to monitor all sorts of different assets and objects at the same time without being confused by various different pieces of kit in the security rooms. Um, and lastly, and um, possibly most popular in the museum sector, places especially in London and indeed um, in the Middle East, seeing more and more of these being used, are lasers being integrated with radio frequency. So um, lasers, again, uh, a really stunning way to effectively prevent people from getting too close to the priceless works of art in your works of art in your museums. Um, just cast fields. Uh, down walls or on the left there in the British Museum, um, down uh, sculpture galleries. Again, monitoring for proximity um, and triggering alarms should someone breach that field. It can also obviously be integrated into a, a localized sounder in that area, as most of these things are fairly inconsequential and um, accidental. And so just a, a sounder going off will, will tell someone that they're getting too close. Obviously, if it's uh, more nefarious than that, then it will appear in the security room in the same way and can be integrated into things like CCTV to populate um, at the front end, showing the security team exactly what's going on and, and where people are moving. So these last two or three slides uh, simply show what it might look like in the front end for, for the software. Um, the alarms that can be generated will um, will populate there on the left hand side and you'll see that there's blue, uh, red and yellow denoting different types of alarms. And on the right you have a, an event report. So there's a, a picture of the artwork in question, uh, a highlighted floor plan of the gallery and uh, suggested actions which can be completely customized by um, each institution that, that uses a software suite like this as you'd expect. Um, so those alarms are for movement, tamper, personal duress as security guards, an offline reader, uh, lasers perhaps uh, either faulty or sending in alarms, again the environmental conditioning and um, within the environmental conditions you also have a, a delta chains which is to say that the humidity might still be within the parameters of what is acceptable for um, that certain artwork, but it's moving too quickly within those parameters, possibly denoting that there's a leak behind it or, or something to that effect. And so even though it's okay, it still needs to have attention um, taken over it. So again, the software allows these, these artworks to be their own master and alert you before damage might be done. Um, so it is sort of, we've moved away from calling RFID a security product and calling it now a, um, a protection product. Um, this particular software, I have to say, is, is an enterprise software owned by uh, Forteco and built by Forteco Solutions. So it's, it's not available in the open market like others are, um, but it is uh, the, the one that we built. But there are other, obviously other suppliers, and um, I'm sure that the DIT can, can make you aware of any. Um, here you have the environmental monitoring configuration in the software. Uh, just showing you how easy it is for your curators to basically input what the minimum max of the temperature, humidity are, and within that, what the percentage change within a certain amount of time, again, is allowed before it starts triggering uh, delta alarms. And for the last one, this is more to do with data analytics. 
So uh, every heartbeat message that's sent in, whether it's on a 30 second or four minute um, tag life will, um, will also go into the history of the software, allowing curators to pull data analytics on the existing environment within a specific gallery, allowing you to see um, the vibration alarms going on with a specific tag or a group of specific tags, tags um, to see how footfall is affecting things. Um, proximity breaches, it essentially allows for you to pull analytics uh, on an artwork by artwork basis, a gallery by gallery basis, or a group by group basis. Anything that can be done on one tag can be done um, through multiple tags as well. Um, so coming towards the end, I thought I would just go through two um, major institutional clients currently using radio frequency identification as their primary artwork protection. Um, the National Gallery in London was in fact Forteca's first client and um, came to us at a time when uh, Forteca was specifically interested in tracking the asset, uh, IT assets uh, within government buildings um, using wireless radio frequency technology. Um, it was indeed the National Gallery, um, Mike Fox at the time, who um, said he would like to try and apply that technology to artworks as they had uh, someone with a clipboard going around uh, the museum every morning, every night, signing off every artwork. And he thought, surely there's a better way to do this. And lo and behold, um, there was. So the National Gallery essentially needed uh, a company to come in and tag at the beginning a few hundred paintings and then now to tag the entire collection, which is up in thousands. Um, and Forteca was able to do this. It, it did it with uh, the first iteration of tags and software, uh, monitoring for vibration, um, and really just monitoring for inventory purposes and should there be any attempted thefts. Um, it also became clear that when the vibration alarms were being triggered, that certain areas of the museum were rattling the, uh, the backs of their pictures simply by the nature of the size of the doors that were being closed. Um, and so those areas are now being stabilized. The sprung floor of the National Gallery has been stabilized uh, due to the vibrations it caused, all of which was uh, only noted once. Um, they were starting reporting these these messages into the software and could pull the information um, together and look at it at a, at a sort of more generalized standpoint. Um, and then we can go, well, there's another point for the National Gallery was the amount of staff they had um, monitoring the collection. Um, they were able to reduce their OPEX budgets, which is something that... Um, we'll talk about now as well in terms of COVID um, by installing a system that allowed for the artworks to monitor themselves. They didn't have to have as many staff constantly monitoring the collection. Um, it centralized the security and protection of the artworks into um, the security hub and caused for less people to be um, walking around. Um, you know, as, as museums, We've seen the government are trying to bail a number out who, who've lost huge amounts of money due to COVID in these desperate times. But a one way to um, to reduce your OPEX is through the use of technology and radio frequency technology. Um, and the National Gallery was doing that 20 years ago. And indeed, over the last few months, we've um, been working with a number of museums, current clients and new clients to, um, to install systems uh, at budgets that they can deal with, but with a view to reducing the OPEX over the next two to three years. The next um, institution is is one that we worked with during the build phase, which is the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. Um, obviously, it's one of the greatest museums in the world, a custom-built monolith and uh, a real symbol of, of the Middle East uh, power and um, enjoyment of the cultural sector and it's pushed to to see itself as, as one of the cultural linchpins of the world. Um, Forteco was uh, was approached to look after and install a com comprehensive RFID system, um, not only on things like paintings and sculptures, but on all sorts of different artworks made of different materials, tapestries, sculptures, ivory wood, whatever it might be, all of which require different environmental conditions, all of which might require different pieces of hardware to protect them, whether that's lasers or bosses or tags or whomever it might be. And then the 
other challenge and very interesting one on this project was the integration required. The Louvre Abu Dhabi being a, a building built in the last five years has the most advanced um, server and building management capacity. And we were able through our software and through building new software and, and writing new code to integrate uh, every aspect of the radio frequency technology at this wireless artwork level into the centralized building management and security management system. Meaning that Forteco uh, Enterprise software was actually running in the background on a virtual server uh, and feeding its information directly into um, sort of a Genetech or Linnell on guard type building management system. Again, allowing for the um, the security staff not to be monitoring multiple screens, looking for different systems, trying to be trained and understand various different systems, but actually just focus on one and through software allowing for that one to, to cover every aspect of the museum security, including in those art, at artwork level. Um, the Louvre Abu Dhabi also asked us to produce zonal tracking. Um, the zonal tracking was something where we were able to um, monitor for artworks moving around the Louvre from the uh, basements up into the galleries, uh, from the galleries uh, into the um, areas where it might be packed up to go away and things like that, and be monitored entirely around, around the gallery. To that effect, you could almost track an artwork from its arrival at the Louvre Abu Dhabi to its entire lifespan, to its lead, to its time it departs, potentially to go on tour, and be able to see exactly where it's been, where it's been hung, and which readers have seen it, and when. Um, so that's really, I suppose, uh, a brief overview of, of radio frequency and, and what it means for museums, how it can reduce OPEX, how it can uh, advance and modernize museums, both um, existing and to be built. Um, and look to um, look to continue to progress and evolve based on what the cultural sector needs. Every one of the um, evolutions that uh, my company certainly has has engendered has been off the back of a request by a specific client in the museum sector. Um, so I can see there's one uh, one question here, which is what are the costs of setting up such a system? Uh, please do, if, if anyone's there, send in some more questions if you have any. Um, my contact details are there on the left and uh, the CEOs are there on the right if you do want to follow us up with us more. Um, but the cost per painting or object, so it's an interesting question and one that's going to be answered in a bit of a convoluted way, which I'm sure is what you're all thinking this, this talk has been like anyway. But um, essentially the, the tags themselves, the, um, the uh, picture tags and the um, case tags, Cost within the region of, of 80 to 100 pounds, um, depending on the, the chip sets that are installed. If you're having the environmental chips, then it's up towards 99 pounds for one of these picture tags. Uh, and it's about the same for these uh, cuboid case tags or sculpture tags. Um, the greater expense is the readers. So these radio frequency readers, again, I have one here, um, cost in the region of 850 pounds, uh, 900 pounds. Uh, so the dual antenna. And so the cost of a system is made up of the prices of the amount of readers required, the amount of tags required, um, and that directly translates into the um, so, uh, software license required as well. The more readers running, the more tags being used, uh, the larger the capacity for the software. So the um, price incrementally increases based on that. Um, we do have some sample quotes for sort of small, medium and, and large size institutions, which I'm, I'm more than happy to share with anyone who's interested or would like to sort of get a larger, get larger gauge on, on what these do cost to install and then obviously weigh that against existing um, security infrastructure. Uh, one more thing on that is to say that the environmental tags are also now being used um, to be adhered directly to walls and not necessarily uh, in um, in uh, in display cases, and that is to do things like replace the um, the use of tiny tag or um, environmental data loggers, um, simply because again, being able to combine those two systems, your art security and your data logging for environmental, makes perfect sense. Your curators can be um, sent the reports at the end of every day or every week through the data analytics that we've already discussed, 
and it could all be run on the same system. So you're not having to pay two different contractors and train people in two different things. So that is a new addition that's come out in the last two, three years and something a lot of our institutional clients are now looking to do. Um, so, I mean, Rosalie, absolutely. Um, if, if you do want to send me an email, I'll post my email here. Um, then we can certainly have a look and obviously um, in terms of uh, quotes and things, that's all done for free and we're more than happy to engage um, with any requests that may come in and look at any specific uh, projects that you might have coming up. Um, and with that, I think as long as there are no more questions, um, I will leave it there. Um, my email is here, obviously. Um, please do get in touch. Um, we'd like to hear from you. Um, we have a lot of exciting projects upcoming. Um, in fact, on the last couple of webinars that I've been listening to, those in the Middle East and some in India as well, um, we're working on, and, and obviously in the UK and Europe, we have um, offices in uh, America, Australia, Paris, Spain, and uh, our headquarters in London. Um, so we can uh, we can basically get anywhere in the world, and we'd be delighted to do so. So please do ping me an email uh, if you'd like to follow up. Otherwise, I'll say thank you very much to Tom and Ian for, for putting this on and for doing it so well during uh, COVID-19. And um, I'll go back to listening to everyone.